Um, my name is Mark Harwood. I'm part of NGRM. Uh, NGRM has organized a series of talks, and this is one of them, specifically today on pinkwashing. Uh, NGRM is one of the, well, it's the oldest LGBTIQ uh, rights organizations in Walter. And uh, last year we celebrated 20 years. And if any of you are interested in our library in Mostar, we even have publications celebrating those 20 years. So if you have time and you uh, can hop over to Mostar, feel free to go there and you can see we would pick up a copy uh, celebrating these 20 years. But tonight specifically is about uh, Pinkwasher. We're very grateful to the German Workers Union for hosting us. Um, and I hope we have a really interesting uh, discussion. The idea is to take just under an hour. We're going to have the panel discussing and then open for questions. Uh, one of our first questions is going to be quite basic because when I'm telling people we're going to be talking about pinkwashing, everyone has basically asked what that is. So we're going to actually start by looking at that because that is, is fundamental. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome our uh, uh, panel here this evening. We've got Julie Allegre Muslim, if I said it correctly. Thank you very much. Uh, she is a Belgium Argentinian queer woman. She works as a philosopher and researcher at the University of Malta, and is an activist with the movement graffiti. Uh, for the Maltese, we'll be more than aware with the movement graffiti, but for the visitors to the island, this is a Maltese left wing organization active against the, expro uh, the oppression and exploitation of people, the environment to animals. Very pleased to have a bit of seedling. We have Denise Apolina. Uh, she's also a Maltese queer woman. She's married, who works as HR generalist at HSBC Global Services Malta. Denise is heavily involved in HSBC in terms of pride and is also part of the executive team of ARC, the Allied Rainbow Communities, which is, of course, organizing the Euro Pride, uh, the organizers of the Euro Pride. Denise's passion and interest of photography, the community, and likes to focus on helping others being at their best. So I shall come to you later about that. <laughs> Uh, and finally, we have Kendrick Boydeen, uh, who uh, represents workers in the public service, public sector, health sector, and private public partnerships. He also focuses on European funded projects and LGBTIQ plus matters. His passion and interests include individual sports, yoga, human and civil rights. Furthermore, he has a personal interest in animal welfare and the protection of the environment. So as indicated, we thought that the best thing to do today is actually begin by first asking the panel what they take pinkwashing to be. And as the name of the, uh, the discussion is pinkwashing vis-a-vis -vis allyship, how they see it as different from uh, allyship. So the floor's open, anyone wants to start? But yes, I uh, just heard. Um, so uh, pinkwashing has different aspects, but I'd like to focus on a national base. Uh, the pink washing uh, for me is when you go to Pride, you see sponsors, and then you know they don't employ LGBTIQ. Uh, through my work, I have encountered this. Some would. They use Pride as a way to market things, to attract customers, but really and truly their workplace is not welcoming different people. So that for me is pink washing, yeah. big time. I think that's, that's, that's the most clear. Uh, pink washing up scene. And I cannot name companies, but through my experience, they, I can assure you that they exist. Uh, and ship is, I can take my organization that they actually uh, had policies in 2001 when everyone here in Malta was quite, uh, if you're gay, silent. Uh, unfortunately, I was a person who used to go to Pride and be on the sidelines and admire people on the MGRF with the banner because I was scared. Uh, and I'm a very confident person, so you can imagine <laughs> the repression, how Monta was back right then. Uh, but the union was there in 2001, they had issued the first policy, uh, and we had even people who were just going away from the union because we were pro LGBTI. Uh, eventually, they recruited even people openly gay, myself, and who were in leadership positions. And I can assure you, I can see allyship because I will say my organization is too pro. LGBTIQ at times, which is nice feeling like that you count as an employee and whatever label people put on you does not make you different than others. It's, it's beautiful. So 
that's the terms and true experience what I see the difference between allyship and pinkwashing. I agree with you, Ken, it's like we had discussed as well last time. So I am on the same basis when it comes to pinkwashing. So you, you, and I think, unfortunately, it still happens when we see on Facebook, the logos, you, they change the logo, you know, we have um, <laughs> rainbow themed this, rainbow themed that, but do you actually, you know, support your, your employees? Do you actually um, have policies in place? Have you got inclusion in place? How, uh, I mean, I'm lucky enough to work at, at HSBC. I mean, personally, I came out <laughs> to my colleagues before I came out to my parents. Um, at work, um, so I mean, it's a very inclusive environment where I work and nowadays working in HR gives me the opportunity to be able, you know, to continue doing the change um, where possible. So, um, I mean, I, I know we're gonna be discussing a little bit later on even as well, how, what we can do and so on, but I'm on the same basis with you, so I leave it to that for now. <laughs> um, I think, as graffiti and as activists in Malta, I think, um, we also see it happening. I think big question can happen through individuals, but also organizations, uh, communities, but also businesses and governments. And exactly what you touched upon, it's, it's like a visibility tool. It's very superficial and it sort of creates the sense of you're included, but only on very specific conditions. And one of those conditions is you, you're sort of welcome to society if you buy our products. So it's very much centered around consumerism, around capitalism. And also it's, I think you, you, you can get included, but you need to be a specific person and you also need to be a specific body. So if we're talking about LGBTQs with disability, poor LGBTQs, brown and black LGBTQs, there are different barriers that we encounter, sort of. Um, and I think that's where allyship differs. I think allyship should, I, I'm not sure allyship is always the right term, but uh, the allyship that we want to see is one about support and solidarity and one that is sort of fighting for structural change uh, and not only a superficial change in visibilities. Um, so, yeah, a lot to untangle, and I'm also really excited about tonight to do that together. I mean, in relation to that, it seems quite clear that um, pink or shale is ultimately um, see as something very superficial mm -hmm. and not uh, actually offering any support. Internally, if you talk about companies or NGOs or maybe even countries, uh, and externally, I was a bit curious. Uh, but then there are those who still argue that even just by raising visibility, that they're contributing to uh, the LGBTQ um, cause in a way. Uh, do you think it was always inherently um, self-serving or even pinkwashing, which is very, um, you know, is very superficial? It can't have any type of positive impact in a community. So I think it can work out yeah. in both ways. And um, if you have, I mean, once you have companies out there, you know, promoting, changing their logo, obviously other companies will be like, all right, X companies doing this. So let's, let's join, you know, let's join. But ultimately, what is the purpose that is that they're joining? Are they joining for marketing purposes? Or are they actually also, you know, helping their employees? Um, not helping, but being inclusive in a, in a working environment. So I think there is some positivity when it comes to that aspect of influencing others, but are we influencing them in the mm. right way? I well, yeah. Yes, I concur. It, it might also be the case that you have companies that are sponsoring and all, and then eventually you people will start asking them, they might include policies, then people. Um, I know a company here in Mosa that nowadays they have the voice of, uh, of the customer that is LGBTIQ person. I mean, all they did nowadays for this Pride Euro Pride is give out cookies to their employees. Um, but still they're employing people, so <laughs> there is something and people are not being discriminated from uh, actually being eligible to go to work. Uh, 
I don't know if they will be eligible to become managers, but at least there is something. It's not a closed door, uh, even though others exist. So there might be uh, this effect that slowly uh, things might change. Uh, for example, I, even the Pride, you might see one or two people that participated there. Uh, but the following year, you might see six or seven from the company, the following 20. So, and things are evolving. Things that are really ordering. Uh, I, I wish they are faster. That's me, of course. But I, I think it, there might be, if, uh, if they are not too uh, hostile about it. If they become hostile, it's just a company that's customer oriented, that's just well rainbow, sponsor it, and that's it, then it's a lost cause. But it's never a lost cause if there is always a bit of change. So it might be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to disagree slightly on this because I'm a bit more ambivalent. I think pinkwashing has this phase of being an ally, but in fact, it's just capitalism. And I think that because it is about visibility, it is about marketing, it's about profits. I feel like LGBTQ persons uh, in their material lives have very little to gain from pinkwashing. Um, if we look at the sort of cycle that pinkwashing goes through, what if we support companies that pretend to be LGBTQ friendly, like Coca-Cola, knowing that they spend literally thousands of dollars on anti-LGBTQ legislators, right? The same goes for Google, the same goes for Amazon and smaller businesses. And I, would, I, I agree that the visibility is important for representation, for feeling safe, and of course, um, a crosswalk in rainbow colors makes me super happy. But the fact that I can buy, for example, makeup with rainbow colors, knowing that probably that has been made on the backs of poor people in the South, on the backs of poor people in the West and in the North as well, why should I celebrate something um, that tries on the exploitation of other people? So I, I see and I feel as a person as well that the visibility makes me sometimes feel more safe in a city or uh, surrounded by corporations. But I do want to question, and I think you, you pose a really good question, like you can influence others, but to do what? To make more profits just because of our communities? And I think the question should always be um, as well, why do you want to be an ally? What's in it for you? So I'm not sure. I won't say it's always inherently harmful, but I think the consequences and the way that it works, oftentimes it is. I think that's a really interesting point and something we're going to put, pick up on later on because one of the questions we have is how do you actually uh, try and remedy pinkwashing or how do you get pinkwashing to at least become something more positive? But at this point, I was interested, related to that, to ask if there is a sense that um, an ish a company or even governments have been accused of pinkwashing. If you have pinkwashing taking place, who do you think has the responsibility to call it out? Do you think it's responsibility for us as individuals, for us as consumers, for NGOs who might be better informed, other companies, so out as whistleblowers if they know what's going on? So where do you see the agents? Because as we've already seen, it's a difficult thing to pin down what pink pushing are can do. Yeah. I, think, I think I wouldn't pinpoint one particular area. I think it has to be everyone's responsibility because at the end of the day, I mean, we, we are living the day-to-day -day life, so to speak, and especially if I know that it's not in this case, but if I know my employer is out there doing this, but then I am, you know, internal network, I cannot be myself. That's already um, a worry. So I think it has to be, and each and every person has to take the responsibility that if they know, so yes, they can reach out to MGRM, but they need to to one, there is that So we will look to see how we can bust the support too, to see how we can report it. So um, that's at that I think first, it would be my, my opinion. That it's not directly to one person, but it's everyone's responsibility. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think everyone is responsible to this and if we want to reduce it and not for it to remain just a window and something to sponsor, 
then yes, we, we must be careful, especially like Julia mentioned, if we know of a company that is sponsoring uh, anti lgbtiq legislation that is making um, all atrocities on children just to make them work, uh, I think that we are responsible to take action and not buy from them. But it can be the case that there are some that are willing to start to make the change. But we as consumers, as a society, must educate, must inform ourselves about the actions that are happening, about the workplaces that they are. Um, some companies might, might not be abusing of anyone or doing anything about legislation, but they're just uh, recruiting people to stay at lower levels as LGBTQ. So even that, we ask around this small island, so where it goes around, we, we will know. So it is really up to us to know and those people that we perceive and are informed of companies, even individuals, they might be individuals, uh, then we purchase from them, we make friends, we ask. So we are really and truly, we are all part of the society and community and we almost be involved in it. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would like to add uh, is that I think the burden of responsibility should not be laid on the marginalized communities itself. Um, I think this is often the case that we expect those marginalized and those oppressed to sort of educate the others, the allies. Um, and I think, I fully agree, I think the responsibility should be on different layers. So I would not only look at individuals and consumers, but I think government also has a very big role to, to play in this and education. Um, but all those levels intersect as well. So I think it's a, a whole approach. Um, in fact, one thing, um, because when we were preparing for today's um, discussion, we sort of like the distinguishing between pinkwashing in terms of uh, the commercial interest and pinkwashing when it's more applied to, say, government actions. And now it's becoming very popular to talk about sports washing vis a vis countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, if we focus specifically on the, the business and the consumer side. I was interested going into a little bit more detail, and I was going to ask Denise first in relation to this. I mean, how feasible is, is it to expect consumers to be able to um, be aware of pink caution? I mean, I think one of the most powerful campaigns vis-a-vis -vis consumer boycotting is the boycotting of uh, products from the West Bank, the occupied territories. And that hasn't been successful because it's difficult to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's something we should expect? Yes, yes. Um, so um, let's take, for example, even as well, when it comes to consumer, so um, how can people notice when we were putting it out there? So uh, HSBC is not in this particular area, but let's take, for example, a bank. So I go to a bank, I identify myself as Mambaini, and I ask them to you know, on my application, I want X to be marked, and they don't give me the option. I don't have that option. It has to be either Mr. or Miss, or as us. So Claude is my wife. <laughs> and we go to the bank for an application, and they cannot go through because we're a same-sex couple, and that's not something offered for us. So clearly, like, why are you going out there saying that, you know, you're, <laughs> you're supporting the, the community when I'm actually coming to you and you're not giving me that option? So for me, that creates um, an alarm. And if it was me passing through that, I would see how I'm going to, <laughs> to report it for sure. Because practically, would it feel if I am part, you know, I'm not able to be myself. And especially living here in Malta, I, I think that's my, my right to be myself. So um, obviously, HSBC, is just, to, just to make it clear, it's not the case um, because it's something that is very pro relation to it. And because even in, in internal systems and so on, it's, it, that's fully available. So you can choose, you know, um, your pronouns and uh, you can choose as well, you know, like whatever you would like you are, it, it, that, is, that is possible for you to, to be there. So I think that would be an area. So very much in that respect, people have to have like a, um, an investment in it in the sense of, more likely to come up because they'd be touched by it, but they'd be, um, you yeah. know. I mean, I was interested, Kendrick, and this relates to, to this question, because uh, you mentioned some local examples, you didn't mention the specifics, but um, <laughs> I was interested to... <laughs> when you um, have instances where people react to um, 
the sense that there might be pinkwashing. Is it because it's been named and shamed, or it's just a natural reaction to the fact that their employees may feel uncomfortable, they do feel uncomfortable about other things, and it just happens to come on as pong? Uh, often it is uh, through the grapevine, uh, especially when a company doesn't employ GPTIQ individuals, it would be through the grapevine that you will know. Uh, so workers cannot come uh, to us and say, listen, I'm being discriminated at work because on the first place they're not being employed. Uh, others, yes, they filmed, they, uh, they were closeted, money. Uh, I, I encountered one case specifically um, where they were outed, uh, everything was a, or what they thought is fine. And then a call was issued, they got the promotion and all. Uh, during the probation period, they fired this person. Uh, uh, they suspected that it's because of this, but they had no proof. And what they did in the contract was that if they, they weren't okay in the probation, uh, they could revert to their previous grade. They didn't include that, and they ended up out. And even the law doesn't protect you against that. You, know, you can be fired from probation without any reason. There's the protection for pregnancy, but this wasn't the case. Uh, it was only the speculation of the individual that this happened. The speculation was there because this person was employed for a long time there. And all of a sudden, they, they got kicked out. So uh, there are things. Other things that I encounter is, and this happened even in, in governmental departments, is you have the government promoting, there are policies to implement legislation, so on and so, so forth. But then there are departments which might be very, very uh, ho homogeneous environments where you have people of the same uh, diaspora and all, that if they got to know someone is different, they might stop talking to them, not going uh, with them to breaks and all. And this, in fact, I had experienced it myself. I was working in IT in a very manly department, and I always got the cold shoulder, you know, never invited to breaks and all. And this I encounter in the places of work. Uh, it has been reduced. I don't know if their, uh, the cases have been reduced or people are reporting less, but through experience, it, now it's less. But it happens, and you cannot force people to become friends. They didn't discriminate, so you just silence. And sometimes it's uh, harder because you cannot find what is silent. And it can really harass the person, and eventually they might leave because they're being the only Edward. And this I've experienced. It. Uh, many times, unfortunately. Yes. It's sad. Good. That's a year. It's a year, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because we're here now during Euro Pride and we're here. Um, I mean, Pride has become almost like synonymous everywhere in Europe. If you don't have a Pride, it's almost like something that's wrong. Right. Ironically, and this is direct of Trudeau, this commercialization of Pride almost encourages, I feel, pinkwashing because companies are almost pushed into branding, uh, rainbow branding, because if you're not, then what's wrong? And I was wondering, especially from a left-wing point of view in graffiti, can actually pride, which is supposed to be about free origin, inclusivity, actually lead to less inclusivity? It's what about that. Big question. Yeah. Um, I, I think the sort of pink question that we're talking about happens all year round, but especially during the pride world, and I think it signals more than ever that it is not about structural change and allyship and solidarity, but much more about making profit and being seen as visible. I do understand the question in the sense of, uh, I feel that you're also going towards, but you're always doing it wrong as a business, right? Because if you use the rainbow flags, you might be pinkwashing. And if you don't, does that mean that you're homophobic? Um, so it is, it's, it is a difficult balance, but I, I do think um, at the ending of your question, we said uh, Pride does sort of expect you to commercialize it. And I do think that happens, but because exactly we're living in a capitalism, capitalist city that sort of rewards you if you commercialize as much as possible, if you're able to address a marginalized community to get pink money to grow, basically, by um, tapping into uh, communities that have normally left behind, been left behind, yeah. 
I mean, it's interesting because I think even from as, as a gay man, so like you start walking around during September and you're thinking, well, I can't let go the rainbow up and why isn't that? And you start questioning something which the rest of the year you wouldn't even think about questioning because they haven't branded themselves in an overwhelmingly inclusive way. I mean, um, in relation to this, I was wondering, do you think there is a harm in accusing I mean, certain countries have been accused of pinkwashing. Uh, Israel, in particular, has been accused of pinkwashing. Companies have been accused of pinkwashing. Do you think there's something potentially dangerous in using that label? Because it might not be the case, because ultimately it is about interpretation. And sometimes, because Kendrick can at least you've, all, you've mentioned examples, which obviously work so much on the wall, um, on the feds. Uh, but also, there can be a backlash from the general population who might feel that, you know, it's not as clear to them that pinkwashing is taking place because they're not experiencing having the, the discrimination. And information is ascension. It's always ascension. Uh, although the rainbow is, is important, then it is that. Uh, before in world, if you put the rainbow, you would be laughed at, oh, the gay person and whatnot. Seeing men rainbows nowadays, uh, for, some, for someone like me, it's a breath of fresh air. Yes, some people are abusing of it, and that's why we must inform, because that is wrong. But we can't deny this is no more rainbows whatsoever. Uh, this is us, this is pride. If someone is using and tempering it for their negative ways, then yes, we must take action. LGBTIQ persons were always taking action over everything throughout history. There was people, LGBTIQ community is very vocal. That's definitely, uh, I think that I like about this community. Um, but I think information is there and we as individuals, societies, whatever, we must see what they're actually doing throughout the year. Pride is not just a week, a weekend, or whatever. It is not. Pride should celebrate humanity 365 days a year, 366 if it's a week year, but every day it's a human day, it is pride. Then we have the celebration. So if we see someone that throughout the year is not celebrating pride as they should in their day-to-day -day things, they are exploiting people, uh, people are not being recruited, promoted, they're being fired of whoever they are, then yes, we should start telling them, listen, during Pride celebration, we should be not part of this and don't put up the private, you know? Uh, we should start stopping the abuse and name and shame what's all that. I mean, they're willing to put us out there in public, then listen, I'm willing to tell you, you shouldn't be there, sorry. Just stay silent and stay away from our celebration and everything. So, yeah, I might be a bit straight to it. I do agree as well, but just, and, and even as we're seeing nowadays on Facebook, like very recently, like seeing vegan companies changing their logo and you see the emojis, the angry emojis and the everything. We know the upset emojis from people and like, my. So, so yes, that can be considered as capitalism, you know, can be considered as companies taking advantage, but I think it's good for, this is, I mean, personally, I think it's good that there is that stuff also. I remember a couple of, I was a couple, quite some years ago, there used to be a, like even stickers um, placed in, in shops in, in Valletta during Pride, just to say that yeah, we are supported. But um, on, I think Friday we stopped at uh, one of the restaurants and there was like the Euro Pride logo on the table. I was like, personally, I, I, I liked it, you know, because I said, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be sort of judged. And um, when talking about that, like, um, I, I, maybe I'll touch a little bit point if I can on the allyship part. So um, as a company, I think it's important that although it's not just September, it's all year round, which I completely agree with it. And even as well at my work personally, I feel sometimes that there isn't too much hype in September. And for me, that is good because that means that all year round, you know, it's become the norm. That's when it comes to um, supporting pride and so on. So, you know, there's like loads of things going on. Obviously, we'll give it a bit of a push in September. Um, but something that we do internally in terms of the allyship is 
it's not a slander, but we have internal training, like awareness training, on how you can be supportive of your colleagues. And um, you'd be given a lanyard, just to say that you, are, you have done the ally training, but it's, it's not just for queer community, like even uh, any, anyone, anyone can do it. But that shows that not just in September, but all year round, you have someone that you can go to if you feel that you need help, if you need to feel that you need to someone to speak to. So as you've mentioned, as a little touch base on the point before, I, I, can, I can see it happening. And even as well from discussions I had with people that sometimes, unfortunately, and it's still, I think it happens that queer um, employees and even as well, religion, culture, that's going to that as well. Um, they get unfortunately left, left alone and so on. And I think, um, Mark, this is when our community and NGOs then, and even as well other NGOs do come in place where even if you sometimes we do an event and you only have one person coming or two, but you're touching, you know, you can be with them, be of support, maybe that what they're not getting from the workplace, we are, you know, helping them out from another side. But um, I mean, I, just to give a bit of context, I leave to you because I keep on talking. It's, it's, no, no, thank you. I mean, I agree with the board of you, and I definitely want to tap into Kendrick's radicality, which I love. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the question about accusations is a very pertinent one. I think it also taps into what we're seeing today as sort of the deba debate on wokeism and, and cancel culture. I think it's a pertinent one, and I, I think accusations sort of make you think of something negative, something that is um, also ungrateful, as if we are ungrateful for demanding more. And of course, as leftists, as graffiti activists, we are in the business of accusations. And I think it doesn't come from uh, a severe distrust, um, but it comes from the accusations that we make, come from a care for the people and a care for political change and a care for radical change. And so I would definitely agree that we should name and shame. We should be demanding more. We should remain ungrateful. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a good thing. I mean, I've, we won't have time for Q and A. So I want to ask, um, I potentially a final question before we open. I mean, pinkwashing is, as I say, something which, when you Google and um, maybe being a bit too commercial, when you do so like a web search, um, it comes up that uh, it's primarily about a lot of research on big American corporations, accusations that they don't extend uh, healthcare to same-sex couples. Um, in a small country like Water, do you see it as an issue? And is it an issue because of intention or that people actively want to resist companies or individuals or as a consequence of our size maybe culturally that you might have people in top positions who were educated say in the 60s or the 70s and they were not exposed to certain groups i mean what's your feeling in pinkwashing water do you see it as an issue or is it an issue that we should be concerned about um yes Yes. Um, before Pride, people who are actually in favor of the rainbow would be there. Nowadays, everyone, as much as they can, will be there. Uh, and not everyone has Pride at heart. So it is of concern. Don't let the rainbow fool you. You know, uh, some people will hug it, embrace it for all the year. Others will just promote it for their benefit. Um, it's, it's not a question of ages. I mean, if you go on Facebook, um, there are different ages who have laughed at the event or put the angry emoji. Uh, often I go to my pensioner sections and I have a blast with them and I joke about my sexuality with these 70 year olds and, the, and I can tell you they're so open-minded and they're like, oh, because I worked in tarts and which was, uh, they were fixing ships and all. And, you know, we knew about that one. Uh, he likes it, so whatever. He will fix you like this. And they have no problem whatsoever. So it really, in truth, it's not a question of age. It's a, and neither of education. It's information. It's not education, it's in the form of education. It's about the families that they grow, the communities that they are in, even the workplaces that they might be present in. 
Um, it's the environment. Uh, teachers can only teach so much. When I turn to like, oh, the teachers, the lecturers, so do this, do this. But we are all educators. I, as a unionist, go to the workplaces and tell them, listen, if someone does not identify as a he or she, don't force them to identify as a he or she. They're comfortable with the day, respect it, what's it to you? And they were like, oh yes, yes, but for me it's difficult because I'm not used to it. So, ah, okay, so it's not a problem because you want to hurt them, because I also, but actually because you're not used to it. And they talk, and maybe even teamwork, and you discuss it about these things, and you see how people change. Oftentimes you see split groups and people don't mingle, and then you have these divisions. So teamwork in workplaces, uh, schools, young ones, uh, when they go to NGOs, um, and not just, you know, the usual uh, conferences. People even like to talk, do workshops, and mix them, you know? You have one, two, three, and I'm the ones go this side, two, this side, three, this side, and people mix and they're up, oh, okay, what shall I do? Uh, and you see this, and when people start to uh, get familiar with another person, you see that their walls and their judgments would start to break down, oftentimes because those and that, and then you tell them, but you know, your colleague, you know, he's like, that. oh, but he's okay. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, he's part of that community, why are you saying this? And you see this, so it's, it's a day-to-day -day thing. It's a day-to-day -day thing and something I encounter every day. But I think communication is key. And people to be open to listen from both sides. Because at times you say, oh, because he's that age, he won't listen to, to me as a gay person. And oftentimes they'll be like, oh, but I never met a gay person. In our times it was illegal. I don't know. You know? And when you talk to people, you realize, ah, so we all must listen, we'll just talk. <laughs> so, my final mm -hmm. conclusion. Listen, educate, and raise awareness. I think it's very, very important. So, talking something like internally, we experienced them, which I took it as a, my mission this year. So, um, although, as I mentioned, we're a very inclusive um, employer as an HSBC, but the education needs to continue. So although we support and so on, um, just to talk about some, someone quite recent, and as I said, my mission th this year. So we have an individual, um, not only one, there is more, but I'll talk in this particular one that um, last year, they identified themselves as she, her. And this year, um, they, are, they identify as non-binary. So I started you know, like hearing other individuals addressing them in the wrong pronouns. I was like, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, you know, I need to. So I started slowly, slowly, you know, saying, Isma, this is the way you need to check. But I don't understand it, like you mentioned. Like, it's fine if you don't understand, but you can change, you know, the way that they feel here. So I started slowly, slowly doing that. Um, I didn't realize I was doing such a positive impact on the individual. And they actually like called me and they were like, thank you so much. Um, something internally that we do, and I'll lead up to it, is it started in 2020 when we were not able to celebrate, celebrate Pride. So, um, so as HSBC, we have an internal as Malta Pride and Employee Resourcing Group when it's, it, it covers Pride and diversity and inclusion. But then we have the international HSBC where we deal with other countries. So there are different things that we go through. And we started what we call it 24 hours of pride. So this 24 hours of pride on a year, I have done an awareness training. And this year I was like, I want to do something related to non-binary to raise awareness for others as well to, to, to deal with. So us as HSBC Global Services, there's HSBC Malta as well. So um, I am maybe a little bit more lucky because we have more cultures and more diversity in, in, in my area. So I've done a live interview with this individual. I was like, would you be up for it? Let's. And the comments we received after, they were like, we didn't know there is just little things we can do to help others be more included at work. So I think it has to come from each and every one of us that we're not afraid, you know, speak up, see if there's something we can do. And I think that maybe I'm a bit uh, too, <laughs> HSBC has done a lot for me. So for me, obviously I, I am pro HSBC, but when it comes to companies, I think it has to come even as well from us to help to, to be on that, on that positive note. But obviously, there are other companies that maybe we can 
health and improving um, and that would lead even as well to the conference there is on the on Wednesday called out at work and um, so that's true by through the Chamber of Commerce so starting a relationship even as well with businesses so that is going to be a good opportunity to even as well hopefully remove some of the pink washing hands get more more companies to be more more diverse with their employees as well so thank you yeah and I think besides the sort of individual things that we can do for each other and the very helpful strategies that are happening within businesses I think what it comes down to as well especially because Malta is portrayed as this very progressive country um, and we have very progressive legislation but as Kendrick also mentioned like the changing mindset and the changing mentality isn't there yet and I think the responsibility also lays with the governments um, if we think about LGBTQ migrants there are several countries that Malta considers safe uh, which criminalize homosexuality which puts their asylum uh, request at risk we also have a lot of problems in the tension so I think especially as a country that is viewed as progressive I think the problems are way bigger than uh, we sort of see at face value and um, the pink washing uh, through governmental means uh, is also very much there and something that we should keep on accusing and uh, fight against. So it's yeah. I think this is a very important point, um, and especially as NGRM, this is something that we are concerned that LGBTIQ asylum seekers and refugees are being treated differently and are being processed in a um, fully transparent way. Um, just to do a small shout out for NGRM uh, and talking about something that you picked up on that uh, sometimes we should uh, be about uh, listening. Um, MJRM is uh, building a um, LGBTIQ shelter in Sandran and we had to meet the Sandran local council and we went into the room thinking this is going to be tough. Uh, you had all these people in their 70s and we were thinking they'll be complaining why are you bring you a shelter to Sandran and we were genuinely overwhelmed by just how positive and progressive and generous they were. And they started suggesting ways they had to raise money for us and so yeah i mean uh just because somebody is of a certain generation is true they can be very uh welcome and inclusive we have aimed for it now so we've only got about 10 15 minutes but i'd like to um see when one in the audience has a question uh for Anna or an individual on the panel would anyone like to break the ice yep the first announcement and I like to see this comment from that specific class question. And I, I think the, the last, I sat with the last thing that you made about the Sandra and in Alisalem and the open sheet session. Yeah. I picked the session at them, so they didn't much go. And uh, I think it's really important that we do not apply stereotypes, yeah. whether it's local council or elderly people. You know. The insane that still acts on our pipeline. So I thought that's just something that I think you know, we should be really more open crying about to really that that's that's just the and platform. And as another the you thought that you're about to brushing around there of a stake how more actually say and what can be done on you know and TP seekers that they do a spoil cut or something or that's a dish well back up. Love the yellow point service, sir. Yes, sir. As again, we should, we should, uh, we should always try. We should the same weapon. There's only like ten and whatever. Um, uh, when I did the UK, uh, the the local supermarket, we had big supermarket, they had the goods. We used to bring six oranges from different um, sources, and at the time, and uh, this uh, still support the housing in calls. Uh, and I was the alpha in Jeff oranges. And then that job and they just kind of, and I ended up speaking to the manager and saying, is it underlying that kind of security and different sea officials? Because I couldn't go by it. Just because you mix the oranges. The following week, I went, they were separate. They were separate. And so I could find, I don't know that out. Um, the animation, Chris, is that in terms of pink and Adam's 
companies that sponsor but don't bring new merchants. I mean, we go to, can you please sponsor us? Right? I mean, you know, I will go anywhere to us. Right? I'm trying to raise money for, well, you know, can you please sponsor us? So, Baron, I think it's, it's not even necessary. I know when I say, well, I need to, you know, but they don't, they don't have the passion, they don't have. So I think you also have to be aware that it's, it's, it's a bit both sides and evil from our side. Um, um, and um, uh, the last issue is about, um, there's always this debate on whether you should lead the legislators should be clean, you know, and change the legislation. And um, 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 then the right sets rule for no eventually, but whether it should be the MI ballot, you should wait until the, the, the situation is right for Finland and then uh, change the thing. And um, but because of it around a long time, and I have part of it a long time for legislation in various areas. Um, uh, I think that it's very important that we have that legislation, and then that legislation will try us kicking us really into the house when it should be. Um, uh, we acknowledge that not anybody is there in the end, but because of the legislation, and because I'm measuring up to me, you, you, you can't even imagine what amazing strides I've had in the world. Every church, it's yeah, I mean, amazing, amazing. It did not exist. It did not exist. It was so completely invisible. It didn't often exist. In fact, on if I ring, yes, got out on that point. Um, so something I was researching quite recently um, is a regard to parental leave. So the Maltese legislation has changed now. It says the father or is. As identified as a second, um, a second, as the second, oh, as the parents. So, I was obviously I'm always like looking to update our policies, and I was like, so we have to update it, and so and so on. And I've been in contact with my colleagues from HSBC UK, and uh, they were like, we're looking to implement this for it to be more inclusive. I was like, it's already okay for us, because you know, in Malta we have that's important, but it, it, not everywhere it's like that. So, and that's. I agree with you. I mean, yes, we have got the legislation, so we're lucky from that aspect, and that will protect each and every one of us, although even maybe the employer might not be in support, because really and truly, if I'm entitled to it through the legislation, that helps. But there are still things that could, could be done, uh, even if the government, you know, there's no legislation. So um, I think it's, it, it's important for employers to, to recognize as well. Make for everyone. Play for what? To, to it. <laughs> a big milestone of getting kicked out on work or discriminated. There's actually a law and you can go to, I don't know, NCP or even to report that you're being discriminated. I mean, before it was just stay silent, you know, and, uh, and suffer it. Uh, I live with that, you know. Secondary schools, the fanboys, I mean, I, I was in an old man. They used to be put it so much. And, Teachers were even okay with it, you know. Nowadays, you don't hear it. Some kids are already adults, and they know <laughs> their sexuality. I'm like, God bless. I couldn't do that, <laughs> you know. And and actually, even the teachers protect them. And something happens, even the parents will be protecting. I mean, back then, it was more common that LGBTIQ would be kicked out or must get married or something. Uh, so it changed. It changed the light. How you know it? I was interviewed for a private school once, and I was asked if I had a girlfriend or if I was due to get married in the. And it was like, oh, that's a nice question. Yeah, I had the best in hand. I have thought of an answer. Yeah. Um, do we have some trouble? Oh, it's a... No. Do we have anyone else who would like to make a comment or? Yes. Hello. When the box told of one part, she, uh, yes, said them. There's a certain dog, this term, AIDS. I had a gun in high school, I was just about raising up. Um, he lost back walking. Um, so I hunted twice and made a hate dragging into this brush on the ultra boss, but I'm lying on that, but just mouth. 
aus Schweinberg. Um, I think I also got a little napples um, from, from the French. I'm really curious to see in one. Uh, respect Zeb Stalini. Yeah. Yep. There's a scene in my mouth. There is a little box, so I'll to deal with boys. I'll, um, you know, as you can see there, the boys all seem to be kind of that house where I bought from. As I was signing on from other boys. This is a fake. The, uh, the money hems up uh, by the first house. They have the Sipnam main gun line, which they chose to uh, uh, and so we're uh, with their fans work the and my player gear and then ban the you know, pings when Henny Wire has a long thing in the action found cookies to the crazy you know, and so on. Um then we basically just have uh, power to deal with it. It was all by the master uh, of Bamsland's responsibility was to do a campaign. And technically, you know, for Bamsland, it's quite a few moments that we were not called. Procedural kind of way. It was part of the campaign. They used to also do a assess any potential merits of aspects of that campaign and it fills up the top of the issue for Cape Forward that the person that you have in the very suffering months. Far from us. Um, the life skillers can be sound, can be lost, as soon as you have show, can be out. Um, you know, rhythm and focus, and five fruit of size, of all lives, or even though the time and we were over and over and that show, they kind of tell the concept that we will forget. That's a far creation of all the winners not to live with all of us. We can also stop the human out of the team. You know, so I dare me, but never. There's a civil storm in this in this world, which should forget about new one because of our issues, you know, and they'll learn how. So, what's the plan? Who do we think? Today we won't have a specific feedback on this. I remember what happened to Dylan. Uh, I think this is a very good example of tokenism in the ultra church community. And I think it's very right that you mentioned that those who suffer most will eventually be those marginalized again. And the fact that corporation is, I think it boils down to the same message, right? What, what is their intention? What is it that they want to see in the world? And it's not, it's, it doesn't come from an intention and care about people. It comes from uh, a desire to make one profit and people will get hurt and they will not know how to deal with it because it's not their, in their interest. Um, and I, if I remember well, they also retrieved the products. I mean, that happens often in the US, they did, right? Again, it's like, it's so obvious in all these different ways that these businesses are in it for profit. And once their homophobic customers don't like it, they will leave it alone and go back into more profitable marketing strategies. So again, I think that pinkwashing is almost always harmful. Even if we think that we profit from it very shortly um, by feeling more safe, by feeling represented, but in the end, it will always be back at those marginalized communities that will be left hurt, especially in cases of tokenism as well. And that's, that's the thing with, with pinkwashing you get included, but on very specific conditions. Either they make profit of you or they make, they make you a token. And you are not really included as a person that you are with all your diverse and contradicting uh, identities. I think that's a beautiful point as well. We shouldn't homogenize people, but we also shouldn't homogenize LGBTQ community. We use this acronym, but it's, it's incredibly diverse and the, the promise that Pinkwashing gives you is, yes, we'll welcome you, you can sort of emancipate, empower, whatever, but you need to conform to our new rules, to this new normativity, right? And if you can't, then just we'll let you suffer by yourself. So I think at the USA cases, um, they are quite known, but I think they are very good examples of what happens when being pushing um, works in these ways. Thanks a lot for the example. 
that I need it. But it says it's gone. Like, yes, but the bus was meeting on this, the different agreement. But on the other hand, a call from, from the big air bank, uh, the baby, and uh, the small school wing is told, might be the corner. Isn't the profit? I mean, I went far past to the company to support to the little one we do make profit. Profit goes together with the prior performance and the price. We are using the system to look again. So then, any one who supports uh, every government afford can make with the free policy keep the distribution is bad luck and the waste on the straw. Of course, then the more even the other, the, the grunt of it, I don't see how this can go, uh, not being the issue, because one was profit. The rate, right. So, I see, can be called on it, but they might have an interest in it, but the same type, obviously, in the one domain. And profit through this. And, and even if it's a social enterprise, they need to make a profit to keep sustaining themselves. So, um, it's the heroin, uh, that's what business is. And the, you need also a profit to pay the wages of the workers. So, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's nice to see a good environment, a good community in a way, place, making success. And then you have a collective agreement to the compensate the workers. So definitely yes. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, does it? Does the business? I mean, the, the, uh, so I agree with you. And the profit should be there. I mean, I, how this workplace, even if all become social enterprises, it's still the concept. If they're not functioning and they not doing the profit to survive, then they will close. You know. So, but it, it, you can't say that if pinkwashing is being abused, it remains there and they're hostile toward GPTI, that's bad. But if they become allies, they will come and place. I mean, we have CEOs that are GPTI communities, and they care. They care. You can't tell them because they're making profit and they're bad. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, it's a fact. You know, this is how it works. Even if you have a farm, and you're just there for your family, you want your crops to grow and be healthy to sustain your family. So even if it's not mon monetary, there is something you need, <laughs> you know? So yeah, the profit and uh, profit with a heart, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what it meant. <laughs> uh, can I? I agree with you uh, to a certain extent. I, I respectfully disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would indeed make the radical claim that we all profit from pink machine. If we participate in a capitalist economy that, could, that uses pink washing, yes, we're all pink washing. We're all responsible for pink washing, for sure. The, the question is not maybe are we or aren't we. The question is maybe to what extent are we pink washing and with, with what reason and what power do we have as customers in a neoliberal capitalist society? Can we avoid it? To a certain extent, yes, but I think some things are unavoidable. I do think that another economic system is possible. I don't think that profit should be the center of our society, and I think that's why, as leftists, um, an allyship doesn't even get to the, the thick of it, to be honest. I think that's why, as allies or, or whatever, in solidarity or whatever you want, we want radical change. We want structural change. We want another economic system. We want a different system. Yes? Good. And be bad, but I would say that my counts will eat fighting in this system. I mean, yes. I can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why I think there is this big difference between pinkwashing, which is superficial change and the change that some people want to see, and that is a radical system change. But, yeah. It's so, until that change comes, I think it involves our responsibility as well. So in the beginning, we were talking about the who has responsibility for big question. And I think there is a certain point something where we can have some solidity with it, but we can mildly in the end to be about when you are like hydrogen, change, and not there are all of these facts. So you can recycle, you can take advice, all of the thoughts. You come out ultimately, there's the 
preparations, which we are made for change, to be able to stop this thing. So, for example, the issues that Ed and CFQ people face are much more systematic than actually, you know, on the individual. So it's fine with us that they discuss this or that you can say that's okay, there's some a problem in the system as well. Mm -hmm. But then we need to both some change. Yeah. It is the responsibility of everyone. So as you, as you said, and, but some oftentimes about, oh, it's their fault, it's their fault, but it's never mine or the other way around. Everyone is responsible, including corporations and all. And yes, we're living now the present. There are things that must change, definitely, for sure, something percent. But we need to live now and hope for a better future. And, but it's, I, I don't agree with blanket statements that all are bad, all are good, you know, uh, because there are people with heart, there are workers with heart, and there are people who don't care whatsoever. And I, I think we must all push for a better community where everyone is uh, doing their part for better systems, better at anything, even on a social base, because at times you might have the best workplace but people will hail from a difficult environment and they're facing some difficult times and they won't find support then. So everything must affect, must take care of our environment for better mental health of the workplaces, of people's dignity, and of corporations being more humble and working towards a better society. Uh, but we must work now and it will not change overnight. Wrong was built in a day. But we shouldn't give up. We should never give up, for sure. So we keep doing our part and pushing. Change will happen. And that's why where um, like these employee resourcing groups, I think, work a lot at work at the workplaces. So you can have prior VRG and you can have sustainability at work. So talking about the environment. So it could be even just one person working in that group. But you can see what's really working well and what's not and what can be done to improve. So, um, and sharing best practice, I think for me, it's one of the most important, you know, things one can do because it might, uh, something might be working good for you in that anyone company and maybe I can tweak ours to make, you know, our people feel more included or maybe, you know, we can change together to see how we can improve. So I think, yes, individual basis is good and sometimes it, takes that one individual to, 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 change, to change things. But um, as I, would, I agree with you as well, and you cannot just take one blanket approach just to say this or that. I think it depends, it depends where close. I mean, if we're okay, do we have any of those questions or this week have round up? Um, I think it was very really heartening today in Europe, right in general, that these issues are business, pinkwashing, workplace are being discussed in multiple forums. I think what's also really heartening is that we have this proliferation motor of NGOs and organizations who are now asking these questions and discussing. Um, I think our panel today is a perfect example of that. Judith from Graffiti, Denise from ARC, and Kendrick Corner has a long history of activism. Um, so I'm gonna thank everybody and hopefully if you see any pink washing, contact these people and vote. After you rub that. Thank you. 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 Thank